Welcome to Napa Valley Wine Academy webinar series. Uh, my name is Monica Bielka Vescovi, and I will be hosting today Jenya Nikolajczuk. Uh, we are going to talk about wines of Ukraine, and we're going to uh, discuss past, present, and uncertain future with the focus on winemaking. So Jenya Nikolajczuk is the WCT uh, certified and is a Ukrainian wine ambassador. She was the co-owner of like a local wine bar chain in Kiev, uh, and uh, so that uh, chain promoted wines specifically from Ukraine. Um, she was also uh, uh, an expert on the project of development of geographical indication of Ukraine, uh, which we will talk about today. And she's a WCT wine educator and contributor to some of the specialist uh, wine magazines. She also created a board game, Wine Inspiration, and in comparison of, uh, with uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Association of Ukrainian Craft Wine Producers, Jenya promoted uh, wine diplomacy and keeps promoting wine diplomacy and Ukrainian wines around uh, Europe. Welcome, Jenya. So, hi, Monica. I'm really happy to be here. I'm really happy. Thank you for presenting me. Uh, thank you. And I hope that we will give really interesting information today about wines of Ukraine. I know so. So let's jump in. I would like to start with a little bit of history. Can you tell us uh, how far back the history of wine production in um, Ukraine goes? Uh, what, what are the roots? So actually, we have really long story, uh, and uh, I should say that uh, on the part of Ukraine, the modern Ukraine, on the territory of the modern Ukraine, we used to have Greeks, we used to have Roman people, and as you know, everywhere you had Greeks, everywhere you had Roman people, so they spread the vineyards, they they come with the wines, and they used to produce wines as well. So unfortunately, I should say one really interesting things that um, a few years ago i've tried to, to find any interesting structured historical information about wine making of ukraine and an interesting fact in our libraries in our archives we don't have so much structured information before russian empire times so it seems that that it's a little bit like hidden I, I would even say and today in ukraine we have few people and we have at least uh, at least me i know three people who is working right now to write books about history of ukrainian winemaking to give an idea that it's much more older than starting from Russian by times, because if today you would find uh, the, the most famous books, they all, almost all of them starting from that times. And almost all of them start speaking only about Russian Empire times or USSR times. So nothing before. But that people, as soon as they started to work and as soon as they started to find uh, like step by step uh, the, the small information, and uh, I know that they already found a lot of things. Uh, we already know about winemaking uh, during Kiev, uh, Kiev Rus uh, times. Uh, mm -hmm. Already knows uh, the, the winemaking even before. So a lot of interesting facts, but for a moment, no structured information. So we are waiting for an edition of that booth. It should be the start of the next year. And as soon as it will be edited, I will read it really properly. And then maybe I'll be more clear with more detailed historical information. But for a moment, we should know that it's uh, more than, uh, so it's more than 1000 years. It's uh, almost 2000 years of history. And uh, we are really old uh, winemaking country. Perfect. So let's uh, let's follow on what we know. So, so the history that you were able to to learn and to study from um, that leads us to today's uh, winemaking. So tell us about that that period in time, um, and maybe we can bring out. I know you prepare the presentation to go with that. Maybe we can bring out the presentation uh, shows the 
to tell us a little more about uh, about where where were you during um, uh, during the times of development and where were you for the last decade? Because that's the very important part. I was uh, lucky enough to meet you and. Uh, to be invited to Kiev um, to educate. Um, and that's exactly how we met. But I was lucky enough to see that booming scene uh, in Ukraine, uh, the booming uh, horeca restaurant scene in Ukraine. And I have to say, I was amazed. I was amazed this was something that I didn't expect at, uh, at the time. And every time I came back to Kiev, it was such a pleasure for me uh, because uh, it was so vibrant. Uh, the Somali Association was working well. The um, uh, students that were coming for, for the classes, they were uh, really hungry for education. We had wonderful conversation uh, and I had a chance to experience the, the, um, the that Horeca movement. Uh, and I would like uh, you to tell us how what were the steps to getting there and how did it look in uh the last decade okay so i have the presentation we can go strictly over there right so i will share now my screen do you see the pres yes you see yeah so uh i will start with this slide uh, saying a little bit uh yes I, I will tell a little bit more so what did I understand uh, during the last 10 months of the war? Uh, that uh, unfortunately, and I would say unfortunately, <clears throat> in that case, so now when you say that I'm from Ukraine and uh, unfortunately people know where is it because they see it every day in the news. Uh, if uh, I was traveling, let's say 15, 10, 10 15 years ago, I was traveling to Europe uh, or anywhere, and uh, when I said I'm from Ukraine, not all of the people even knew about an existence of that country. So today it's not a deal. And unfortunately, because of the bad situation, and because of the bad uh, things which is happening right now in my country. Uh, but we are quite big country anyway. And uh, I also think that it was like a, a big discovery for a lot of people. A lot of people saying to me, oh, we didn't know that Ukraine is such a big country. And um, during last I would say decade uh, uh, we were developing really fast even even uh, especially in the wine making and I will speak about it a little bit later and uh, just saying briefly saying generally uh, so we have in Ukraine you, you see the map right now so we are in the eastern part of Europe uh, we have two seas we have uh, Carpathian mountains we have Crimean mountains and uh, just to give you an idea about the size of our country so if you would go let's say from the east to the west it's more than 1500 kilometers from east to west and from north to south if you will go from the north from Chernigiv let's say to Crimea it's more than 1000 kilometers so just to give you an idea about the size of course it's not USA <laughs> but it's still quite big country uh, among the European countries so saying about the history uh, I hope it will work, yes. Uh, saying about the history of Ukrainian winemaking, as I said before, so we are quite old country with um, with a lot of uh, with a lot of roots about winemaking. But let's say starting from USSR time, uh, so everything changed. So I uh, uh, before when I started uh, when I tried to find any interesting information about pre USSR times and wine making in pre USSR times, I found a lot of information that uh, we used to plant uh, a lot of vineyards uh, on the hills. Uh, we used um, uh, some of the um, some of the cities which today. Um, are not growing any vineyards at all, but in let's say in um, in the old times, like 100 years ago, that cities were promoted as the wine making cities, and uh, I even found uh, the posters, uh, the, the posters from that time, which uh, showed us people picking up the grapes uh, and uh, making wines and so on, and just pretend that uh, cities today. Uh, 
has nothing in common with the, with the winemaking. And uh, the big problem is that when USSA came, uh, they wanted quantity instead of quality. So I believe it's the common story for a lot of uh, countries in the world. And for our country, it was the same. So they just eliminated a lot of vineyards which were uh, planted on the hills and they tried to grow everything on the plain so that to make the mechanization possible. And they also started to work a lot with the hybrids and they started to work with, uh, with the grapes which are resistant uh, to our climate, which are resistant to disease and uh, to produce big uh, quantities of wines. So, I believe the same story you can read about other countries as well. But uh, the problem for us that uh, till, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, it was like that. So the things started to change only recently. Another one thing is that uh, we are really, we used to be really good in sweet and fortified wines. Uh, but during USSR time, to say truth, we didn't have so much dry wines. And um, even if you, if you would speak with all the people here in, in Ukraine, so all the people, usually they don't drink any dry wines. So usually they say, oh my God, it's too acid for me. I don't want that. And uh, But we still used to produce really good sweet wines, really good fortified wines. <laughs> but another one problem is that the names for that wines usually was stolen. So unfortunately, we still have some uh, port wines. We still have some Harris wines. And only now, because Ukraine uh, signed an association in 2017, signed an association with the European Union. So only now we're starting to move away that kind of names from our market. Uh, so that's to, to have our genuine names, not the stolen one. Another one thing uh, which you should understand about USSR, so it was absence of private property. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have that stories as you can find anywhere, I don't know, in France, in Spain, in Italy. When you read the history of the uh, when making family and you read that. Uh, so it's um, a lot of people. So, Almost 100 years ago, our family started to produce wines and we make the quality better and better. And our grandfather planted some grapes and so on and so on. So the family wine making, let's say it's a kind of new thing right now uh, in Ukraine, because before that, everything was owned by state. And uh, what we had during USSR time, we had the big, big farms with the capacities of like 20 million bottles, 30 million, million bottles. And uh, the idea was to produce a lot, not really matter of what quality. And uh, another thing about uh, another thing about uh, USSR time, in 1986, that we had an NDL campaign uh, and during that campaign, a lot of uh, a lot of vineyards was just replanted. So uh, I read different uh, sources, and some of the sources they say it was like eighty five percent. Another one sources said it's ninety five percent. So anyway, so the majority of the vineyards was uprooted. And what does it mean for us today? For us today, it means that some of the local grapes, some of the interesting grapes, um, we can say they are lost. Uh, and um, in Ukraine, you won't find today so old wines. So it's uh, impossible to find like 100 years old vineyards or 80 years old vineyards. So the oldest one, me personally, I know, so it's like 19, uh, 1974. Uh, but usually, uh, especially the winemakers who only started to work with the wines recently, who only started to speak uh, to speak about quality, so usually they started to grow new vineyards quite recently. So the majority mm -hmm. of uh, good quality winemakers today, they work with uh, sorry, can you can repeat, please? You, you mentioned that there's 1974 uh, vine. How do you date that? How do you know that the, the vine is from 1974? Is there a um, is, is there an information that's really available about that? 
Yes, yes, they are, of course they have information. So the vineyard I'm speaking about, this vineyard is owned by Shabo Company, Shabo Winery, mm -hmm. and uh, Shabo Winery. Uh, so uh, I would say it's one of the best winery today. And the history, the history is like that: that uh, the family, so they bought um, they bought a farm in 2003 and started to rebuild everything so some of the vineyards they replanted but some they see the potential and that vineyard was the potential itself so they just leave and uh, the vineyard i'm speaking about so it's 19 i'm not sure or 74 or 76 and it's our local grape variety the name of that grape is tilti I know it's really hard to pronounce, but anyway, so it's our local grape and um, it's ungrafted, uh, it's ungrafted uh, wines. So, yes, they have, they used to have grape information. Right Yes, yes. So that they, they they're working, and I should say that Shabo Winery is the biggest promoter of that local grape Tiltikuruk, and uh, they make a lot of efforts uh, so that people starting to speak about it. Mm -hmm. So, what okay. were the factors that inspired the movement? So you were in those USR times, but. There's generally, if we look at the history um, in a, uh, Central and Eastern Europe, you see that there's either a person or uh, a, a, a company or a group of people that makes that movement, that starts planting uh, uh, vines, that starts working with the vines. For Ukraine, who was it? Who was that spiritus movement who just uh, said, hey, we used to make wines. Let's go back to that and uh, let's uh, recover that history. Yeah, so actually when USSR finished in 1991, so what did we have in, in that time? So we had the state wineries which were in really bad condition and uh, some of the businessmen, so they just bought that old farms and uh, they still make a big quantities of not really good wines. And from my feel, uh, the movement starts in 2003, 4, 2005. And the first one who started to speak about the quality of Ukrainian wines and quality Ukrainian wines itself, that was Crimean producers. So in 2005, as I remember, uh, the first uh, winemakers in Crimea, so they made an association, an association of, I don't remember what was the name of that, but it was like quality Crimean winemakers, something like that. And they were one of the first who started to speak about the necessary of the limited, uh, of the limited crops, the necessity of the promoting local grapes, and uh, they they made a document. They made a document where they state uh, how do they want to work. And uh, as I remember, that was the first <laughs> that was the first thing when at least people starting to speak about uh, interesting Ukrainian wines. I even me, I, I can say my own story. So in that time, I, um, so. In the starting from 2005, uh, 2007, I was working in the distribution company. So we used to, to make an imports of um, French wines, Italian wines, Spanish wines. And uh, I was the one who always said that, okay, guys, the French wines is really good. The Spanish wines is really good, but I wouldn't recommend you any Ukrainian wine. But then in 2011, uh, I was in a business trip to Crimea and uh, I met a guy. So he was a, just, just a simple guy and we started, he, he was visiting my presentation, he was visiting my tasting. And after the tasting, he just came to me and said, thank you so much. It was really interesting information. So just in case you will stay for a few more days here in Crimea. So I'll be glad to, to, to invite you to my vineyards. We have a small production here. So just in case you will have time. So 
come to our place. I was quite snobbish at that time. Uh, I was like Ukrainian wine, so I'm not sure something interesting would be there. But I had free time, <laughs> so I had nothing to do. So I call uh, to that guy and uh, he bring me to his vineyards. And I should say it was a turning point in my special in, in my special history uh, because I saw someone whom I saw in France before, in Italy, in Spain, meaning really passionate person, uh, passionate about his vineyards, passionate. Uh, so it was the first time I felt that Ukrainian winemaker is not about like making business, making money, ma making quantity, but he is about changing the things. He's about promoting the good quality. He's about promoting the terroir. And uh, from my point of view, that was a turning point in Ukrainian winemaking. And uh, then we had a few other uh, other things which changed the, the, the how to say, the, the things. And uh, from, I will try, I don't know why it doesn't work. I will, I'm trying to change uh, the... There we go. Do you hear me? We can hear you and, we'll, and yeah. we can see so, the oh, yeah. presentation. So if you can just move the uh, the bar, the bottom bar yeah. slightly lower. Yeah, so um, I think that now you see the, the first. So, uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, the few other things went. So the first one, unfortunately, we lose Crimean uh, wines. We lose Crimean market in 2014 when uh, Crimea was occupied by Russia and it's still occupied. And uh, I don't know if you remember in my bar, uh, on the wall, we had a big map of Ukraine, and uh, on on the part of Crimea, we had a special hashtag: "We are missing, we are missing your wines." <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, for a moment, we don't have any connections with the Crimean winemakers. Uh, we are not um, the inland Ukraine are not allowed to um, are not allowed to bring any Crimean wines and uh, unfortunately we are we are quite cut from what what is going there and um, as soon as Ukraine uh, lost uh, Crimea uh, as soon as uh, Crimea was occupied I would say it will be more correct uh, I should say that a lot of inland winemakers, they starting to work harder uh, on the quality. And uh, after 2014, after as soon as war started, and one more time, the war started not in 2022, it started in 2014, and part of Ukraine was occupied in that time, a lot of people starting to be more patriotic. A lot of people starting to be more loyal to the local producers. And when customers, they wanted to see better quality wines, the producers also starting to think about producing better quality wines. And here in Ukraine, I, I would say we have a few people who move, who make this a lot of efforts to move the things. And uh, <clears throat> I won't be shy. I can say it was me and my partners when we opened uh, the Lucky Locals bars. You shouldn't and, be shy. Uh, and I have Lucky Locals product with you uh, as well. And um, uh, and I I have to say, uh, ju ju just to add to that, uh, when, when I met Zhenia, I didn't know anything about Ukrainian wines. She uh, actually took me to her wine bar. She, she, she um, did a tasting for me with the uh, Ukrainian uh, wines. Um, she actually was so passionate about Ukrainian wines uh, that made me right away want to learn more, want to study more. I actually started in conversation with our students that at the time we were uh, we were teaching at the um, Ukrainian Wine uh, Spirit um, Academy. And at that time, all of the students were so, uh, it turns out that everybody is so patriotic, as you say, but they everybody is so excited that there is a Ukrainian winemaking. And when we had breaks and when we had lunch breaks, they would actually bring out the wines. Like, you should try it. You should know this. You, that, that's where, when I tasted the native grape varietals uh, for the first time also. So, um, I think you have a you do have a great contribution uh, because since then I've watched uh, you grow and I've watched how you uh, 
spoke about Ukrainian wines very much around the world, you know, in uh, uh, in uh, uh, real life situations and uh, online. So this you are a great contribution, and I do remember our conversations also um, uh, when I was there when you were telling me how the uh, geographical uh, indicators uh, and um, in Ukraine are being developed, uh, how how you're supporting yourself that, and I would love to, for us to, to move that conversation, you know, to to what happened with that because back then when we were talking you were talking about the uh development of geographical indications in ukraine you were talking about the new wineries that are coming up you were talking also about wine making you you were planning to make wine yourself uh so tell us what are the regions where can we expect the winemaking? Uh, what are the influences or uh, climatic influences on that winemaking and how they're different stylist that differ stylistically? Because that's important. You've already mentioned that we have the uh there are the mountains, the seas, all of those are important in, uh, influences on the styles that we can expect from Ukrainian wines. Okay, thank you so much. It's, it's really a pleasure to, to hear what, what you said. But I also want to add that we have a few people here uh, and we have um, a few girls. Uh, the name of one is Alina Tenetka, another one is Masha Skochinka. They are so-called flying enologists right now. So for a moment, they're working in New Zealand and they also have an experience of working in New Zealand, in USA, in Germany, in France, uh, somewhere else. And um, I should say in 2000, uh, I think it was 2019 or 18, uh, they developed the school of craft winemakers. So actually they were the one who gathered together uh, the new newcomers in, in, the, in, in the winemaking business. And usually, and, and usually uh, so what we see right now in Ukrainian wines that uh, people who are just passionate about winemaking. So they used to be lawyers, they used to be accountants, uh, they used to produce furniture. So they was passionate about wines, let's say five, 10, 15 years ago, and they wanted to produce wines by themselves. So they had money, they had passion, and they decided to invest, but they just didn't know how to make it. So the two girls, they just made a school of craft wine makers. And uh, I would say they, they just gathered together that people and saying, okay, guys, to produce wine, you should. To make this, to make this, to make this, and uh, they make a great, uh, they made really great projects. Of course, they made a consultancy as well. And I should say, as soon as they opened that school, the quality of craft Ukrainian wine makers, so it's still grow and grow and grow. So speaking about modern days, so the new family run wineries, it's something in the which started to develop really fast during the last years. And uh, in 2018, uh, we changed a law. Uh, in 2018, in our law, the new term uh, appeared and that new term sounds like a small winery and uh, the legislation process for that small wineries are a little bit easier than it was before 2018 and let's say only for four years so starting from 2018 till today uh, so the quantity of ukrainian wineries so it's doubled and i would say even more so before 2018 we used to have less than 50 official wineries now we have more than 100 and i know that another more or less like 30 wineries they they are on the way of receiving license at least they used to be before the full scale war started so speaking about uh, speaking about the regions and everything now you see the map of ukraine and uh, the regions which are uh, in a color uh, so we have official six winemaking regions in our legislation. So it's Mykolaiv region, Kherson, Zaporizhia, Crimea, Transcarpathia, Odessa and Bessarabia. So officially in, 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 the, in, the, in our legislation, we have six regions. But you should understand that uh, technically, because of the global warming, because of the movement of that craft winemakers, you can find vineyards today all over Ukraine. 
But in legislation, we still have that six, which are mostly on the south of the country. Why is it like this? And what does it mean in our legislation? So it means that, for example, if you are the new, uh, new winemaker and you want to grow vineyards, let's say in Kiev region, which is on the north and which is uh, which is not official when making region. So you just can't receive uh, funds uh, to plant the vineyards from the government. But if you would be the same small winemaker uh, and uh, you want to, to plant the new vineyards, let's say in Odessa region, which is on the south, it, which is supposed to be the official winemaking region. So potentially you can receive funds from the governments to replant uh, or to plant a vineyards. So it's only, I would say, a question of some laws, but technically you could find vineyards almost everywhere today in Ukraine. And even Ukraine is situated between 45th and 52 parallel in the Northern Hemisphere. So today you could find the vineyards on 50th parallel. So in Kyiv, let's say, you can find the vineyards in Chernigiv, which, which is almost the Northern, uh, northern part. And because of the global warming, it became normal uh, to make experiments with some grape varieties and to grow new plants, to, to grow new vineyards. So what is going on right now in our legislation? So we have that association of craft winemakers. You mentioned before, I'm working with them a little bit. And uh, they are lobbying the changes uh, in, in our legislation so that to make all the territory of Ukraine the official winemaking, uh, winemaking zones. But for a moment, it's it's like that uh do you have any questions for a moment I, or i can move I forward a question for you i would like you to speak to the styles of wine that we could expect in ukraine because if we look at Nikol nikolaev uh, region and we uh, and location of other wine region they significantly in different location with different influences stylistically how would you describe describe wines from different regions and what are the uh, influences on uh, each of the regions, um, uh, well, particularly when it ca comes to the topography, when it comes to the elevation as well. Mm -hmm. So, if you will see uh, to, to, to the map of Ukraine, uh, so you will mention that the south, uh, the south part, except Crimea, so we are speaking about the Odessa region, we are speaking about Kherson, Nikolaev, Zaporizhia, so it's uh, mostly plains. And let's say 70-80% uh, of all the vineyards of Ukraine, they are concentrated, uh, they are concentrated on the south. And uh, on the south, uh, so Let's say that we don't have really strict rules. We don't have really strict appellations for a moment. So that means that our winemakers, they are more or less quite free uh, to make any style of wine they want. So we don't have like uh, an appellation, Odessa appellation, which, um, which control the production of, let's say, aged red wines. So we don't have it. It. So in Odessa, you can produce any style of wine you, you can imagine and you want to try. So uh, saying generally, so the south part of Ukraine is much hotter, of course, especially Odessa region, especially Bessarabia. So we have, uh, so it's quite rough uh, region. So we have, uh, you should use um, the drip irrigation in most of the cases. Uh, in other case, nothing, nothing will grow over there. And when we're speaking about the south, so mostly we are speaking about big quantity, big quantity winemakers, but of course, you can find some craft winemakers who make the natural wines over there and the movement of natural winemakers. It's quite big in Ukraine as well uh, today. And um, that parts uh, of the, we also have a big plantations of the vineyards, which are supposed to be uh, the grapes for the production of sparking wines in, in the old times. And it still is uh, like that, even if it's for a moment could be quite hot. So when, then you see it, Transcarpathia region, which is situated on the west. And uh, if you would see to the map, so we have a Transcarpathia, then we have a Carpathian mountains. So that means that uh, in Transcarpathia, uh, the climate is not so... Um, 
you don't have so big differences. Uh, so it's not so continental, so it's you don't have so big differences uh, between uh, winter and summer as you would have, let's say, in Odessa. Because in Odessa, which is on the south, you could have during the winter, it could be like minus 15, minus 20, but during the summer, it still could be plus 40, plus 42. In Transcarpathia region, the climate is a little bit more mild. Uh, the climate is not so so big difference. So in winter, it's uh, more or less zero, maybe minus five in the coldest day. And uh, during the summer days, it's not so big temperature as well. And let's say Transcarpathia region is supposed to be the region for production of white wines and of production of rosé wines. And recently they started to develop the production of sparkling wines as well. Uh, but as soon as climate changed, uh, they also are capable to produce interesting red wines for a moment. Uh, we have really good examples of uh, really interesting Pinot Noir from Transcarpathia region. We have a really interesting Zweigelt uh, from Transcarpathia region. So it is something which is worth to try. When we're speaking about all the rest, uh, Ukraine... Uh, uh, sorry? So basically, the cooler climate grape varietals are, are planted uh, in Transcarpathia. Yes, the, the cooler climate and a lot of aromatics grapes. So aromatics, it's something which is really traditional for that kind of climate, uh, for, for that kind of region. So it's, it's historical one. So, for example, in Transcarpathia, we have one... Um, we call it local, to say truth, but uh, it's Hungarian grape, Chetsugi, uh, mm -hmm. which is an uh, aromatic grape. We have a lot of uh, Moscato grapes. We have Sauvignon over there. We have Riesling in the Transcarpathia region. And um, we produce really, really interesting rosé wines. So um, even some people, they are promoting Transcarpathia as the place for great rosé wines. Of course, we are not the competitors for Provence <laughs> region, but uh, you can find really, really good, really interesting wines. And uh, yes, when we are speaking about all the rest of Ukraine, so the thing you should understand, and so the more you go to the north, the more cooler climate grapes you will find and uh, some hybrids as well. So, for example, our craft wine makers uh, on the north, north part of Ukraine, they like Solaris, for example, and uh, they experiment in a lot with that kind of grape uh, right now. Uh, one of the um, producers, Sorry? Very popular in cooler climate. For example, in Poland, the, that's what's being used also. So uh, the uh, I, I know you were working with uh, Geisenheim as well. Is there a connection between the university to bring in, um, to bring in uh, hybrids and to develop the hybrid uh, culture within Ukraine? Because that's, this is important for cool, cool climate region, especially when we go farther and farther north. North, and there is a lot of talk in the uh, in the wine world about the importance of hybrid, and possibly in some of the wine regions, hybrids being uh, even more important. <laughs> for the center reason, particularly being prone to frost, uh, being uh, um, more resistant to the diseases. Uh, how much of the percentage of the of production would you say in the whole of Ukraine is uh, our hybrids? And what are the new developments with hybrids? Uh, I'm not sure about the, the, the proper percentage, I should say, but um, when we're speaking about the craft wine making in Ukraine, so it's still a small, small proportion. So the, the grapes like Solaris, so it's rather exception than the rule. So you won't find a lot. But then we still have a lot of Isabella in Ukraine. And uh, it, it is something which... Um, bring us, I would say, bad fame. <laughs> and uh, even 15, 20 years ago, you could find a lot of Isabella everywhere, and especially in Transcarpathia region. So now, as soon as uh, producers starting to, to, to look 
to the quality side. So they are eliminating uh, that kind of grapes. And even they work with the hybrids. So they are trying to work with uh, another one type of hybrids. Uh, for example, I know that one of the producers in Odessa region, so uh, they used to make an experiments with the new hybrids, which um, were developed by Rao Shedo uh, Nursery. And uh, that are the hybrids, which uh, cont uh, the content is like 94, 96% is Vitis vinifera, and only like 4, 6% is Labrusca or something like that. So it's uh, almost with uh, uh, all the flavors and everything like Vitis vinifera, but quite resistant uh, as uh, but quite resistant as um, American wines, uh, and uh, they have really good results with it. So maybe so that was an experiment. They planted like oh. a small, uh, so that, small let's quantities, talk about but the varietals that um, uh, that you use in Ukraine. What are the grape varieties? Um, that are most popular in uh, Ukraine at the moment? Uh. So in the moment, you will find a lot of international grapes in Ukraine. So we are working a lot with Cabernet, with Merlot, with Chardonnay, with Riesling, with Pinot Noir. We have Georgian grapes like Sapiravi, like Rokatsiteli. You can find uh, Sauvignon Blanc as well in Ukraine. But of course, we understand that we should work uh, a little bit harder to go to export markets. And as soon as I see right now, uh, usually export markets, they're interested, of course, they're interested in some local, interesting, indigenous, uh, unusual grapes. So there are a few we are promoting right now and more and more producers starting to work with it. For example, Odessa Black Grape, or the second name of that grape is Ali Berne. So maybe maybe you saw some Alibernet in Slovakia, for example, in Czech Republic. So it's the same as our Odessa Black. So that grape variety becomes became really popular during the last five years. So just pretend uh, in 2016, when I opened like local wine bar, of course, I wanted to have in my wine list something interesting. I wanted to have some local grapes. And in that time, I found, uh, so it's only how many years ago? It's only like six years ago. I found only one producer which officially produced uh, Odessa Black on the market. So I, I found a few small craft winemakers, but they didn't have a license for that moment. So we, we couldn't uh, sell their wines in the bar. And only five years after, uh, we made um, a kind of competition of the blind uh, of the blind tasting of Odessa Black, and only on that competition was presented like thirty two or thirty three different producers of Odessa Black. So only with like five six years, uh, the popularity of th that grape became really enormous. <clears throat> really, a lot of uh, craft, a lot of winemakers itself, they started to produce interesting wines with that. I should say that not all of the producers they have their own plantings. So mostly, especially when we're speaking about craft winemakers, especially from the northern part, some of them, they're still buying the grapes from more southern parts and not all of them have their own vineyards for a moment. Another one, really interesting grape, and uh, I believe in the big, big future uh, of that grape is Tiltikuruk. Uh, the one I already mentioned. And uh, Tiltikuruk uh, is the grape you can find on the south part of Ukraine, especially in Odessa and especially in Nikolaev region. But um, only three years ago, only four years ago, uh, we had only one producer on the market which produced that grape variety like officially that was Shabo company and they already said that they made a lot of efforts to promote that kind of grape and now more and more winemakers the small one uh, as soon as they see that that grape is interesting that that grape received really good scores even with um, uh, with an important wine influencers all over the world so they starting to grow and they starting to produce Tiltikuruk as well and um, an interesting thing about Tiltikuruk to give you an idea so this grape variety for me is something in between Sauvignon and Chardonnay meaning it has a really good acidity 
community and uh, during use as a time a lot of sparking wines was produced with that kind of grape today no one is producing sparking but the history we have like that and uh, when it's aged it really looks like chardonnay and uh, i have a funny story uh, a few years ago in 2018 uh, we took part in the international blind uh, tasting championship it was uh, held in uh, france and uh, one day before the championship we had a big uh, we had a big dinner uh, when uh, all the countries which were participating in that uh, championship they bring their own wines to present uh, to present the people and uh, we presented Tilti Kruk, we presented uh, an aged version of it and uh, uh, and it was really really it was really really popular so a lot of people they came to us and they say wow it's so it's so nice it uh, looks like a good ch aged chardonnay so you even can compare with some burgundy wines because you have really good acidity but at the same time so it develops really good uh, in the oak so i really believe in the future of that grape uh, the only problem for that grape, I think, is uh, the name, which is really hard to pronounce. <laughs> but uh, maybe it needs just a little bit of marketing. Uh, with, uh, with the hard to pronounce the grape varietals. Um, so um, there's a, perhaps there's a way to, to, to learn from other countries how to work with that as well. We do have some questions coming from the audience uh, that I would like to ask you. Um, one, uh, one is about the grape varieties and actually about the uh what is the acreage uh, of the vineyards altogether at the moment uh, in ukraine um sorry i didn't hear the second uh, question about what uh, okay so um let us know how, how, what is the production of the uh, ukrainian wines at the moment and how many hectares uh, of the vineyards there are Uh, so the, the the official uh, the official data uh, which I saw from the last year from 2021, so it was uh, 36 uh, 36 thousand hectares of the vineyards, mm -hmm. but not all of them are devoted to the um, to, to the production of wines. Some of them are devoted to the production of just uh, grapes to eat. So. If to give you an idea, uh, during USSR time, uh, Ukraine was one of the biggest country among USSR countries, and we used to have like more than 150,000 uh, 50, hectares of the land. So it's for a moment almost like four and a half, five times less. But one more time, the quality is a little bit greater than it was during USSR time. And uh, a lot of vineyards, um, they were uprooted um, in between uh, like 90, 2005, uh, I would say something like that. Um, and we'll see what will going on in the next years, uh, because uh, for a moment, a lot of vineyards are occupied and a lot of vineyards, especially on the south and southeast of U Ukraine, uh, they are destroyed by um, they are destroyed uh, by Russians, actually, because they are, it's bombed uh, almost every day. With that, we have to uh, talk about what's happening right now, because we know we, there was a 2022 vintage, if you can tell us what are the winemakers doing uh, now to preserve um, all of the uh, winemaking that has been uh, renewed done uh, to this point that uh, uh, how are the vineyards looking uh, at the moment? How many producers are actually able to make the wines and how did they have to pivot or how did they have to change altogether uh, what they're doing because of the war? <laughs> So um, you should understand that Ukraine is 
quite big, as I said before, and uh, luckily not all of the places are occupied uh, for a moment. So when we're speaking about winemakers in Transcarpathia region, for example, thanks God, it's quite uh, it's quite safe for a moment. And thanks God, the producers there, they, um, they are not suffering from the shelling, they're not suffering from the bombing, and uh, they had an opportunity to produce like a normal vintage. The winemakers in Odessa region as well. So I've spoke with a few of them. Uh, they said that uh, 2022 is quite promising. And uh, for, for example, Shabu winemakers, they said that uh, maybe it's one of the best uh, during the last decade. So the, quant- the quality of the grapes they received, they're really happy with it. So the ripeness is really, really good. Uh, so. That year was a little bit dry, but not as dry as 2020, as 2021, for example. When we are speaking about uh, wineries which are situated in uh, Nikolaev region, in uh, Zaporizhia region, so the, the, the southern part, uh, so unfortunately, the situation is not really good. Uh, so some of the vineyards, they are occupied and uh, they had no opportunity to produce uh, nothing or the opportunity to produce just a small quantity. So I have spoke with one winemaker. He's uh, from uh, Nikolaev region. So he's just on the front line. Uh, he's situated just on the front line. And uh, he sent me a video. Uh, showing me his vineyard. And my question was the same. Did you have an opportunity to harvest at least something? And he said me, so he sent me the video saying, do you see my vineyards? So that part is okay. So we harvested that part and we have a good quality wines and we even could an opportunity to produce uh, some wines. <coughs> but this part of the vineyards. So do you see that small thing in the soil? So this is um, this is a mine. So we have a lot of mines uh, on, on the vineyards right now. That's why we just don't have an opportunity to enter our vineyards. And we are waiting while miners will come and will put away uh, that things. And when will it happen? Nobody knows, of course. And it needs some funds for it, first of all. Then it needs so that uh, territories would be safe and not occupied. And another one guy I've spoke with, he's situated in Zaporizhia uh, region. Uh, his winery itself uh, is not occupied, so it's bombed every day, but it's not occupied uh but his vineyard he said that he planted vineyard like three or four years ago and uh, this year supposed to be the one of the first years when he at least could harvest at least something and um, unfortunately the territory which, which is only like 30 kilometers far from his winery itself so it's totally occupied and uh, he doesn't have any opportunity to enter that part and um, he has no idea what is going on with the vineyards right now so what can i say we still will have uh wines of 2022 vintage uh we want to believe that uh, that vintage will be the vintage of uh, our victory and we will drink great wines uh, great wines and celebrate the victory uh, but uh, a lot of uh, winemakers they couldn't harvest uh, the grapes and some of the wineries they are destroyed uh, so they don't, unfortunately, they don't exist anymore. So the the photo you see is the real photo, which was made uh, in March. Um, I think it was March or April uh, by Slivina Village Winery, which is situated in Nikolaev region. So it's on the south of the country. So they're situated just on the front line. And uh, unfortunately, the photos like that, I saw a few. So the vineyards could, could be like that. And um, another and another big, big problem is that uh, the price of everything, of course, it's going up. Uh, the price of logistics is enormous right now. And um, for a moment, the big, big problem for not only winemakers, but for all of the citizens of Ukraine. Uh, so the last uh, one, the last months, uh, Russia bombed hardly our infrastructure. And we don't have... Uh, 
the most of the regions, they don't have enough electricity right now. And of course, when you don't have an electricity, it's not easy to produce uh, to produce anything. We are not speaking only about mines, but just say, just saying generally. And another one big problem is uh, a lack of glass because on the start of the war, uh, the biggest producer of the glass, uh, the glass factory in Gustomil, uh, it was totally bombed. It was, uh, and they supplied like. I don't know exactly, but like 60, 70% of the bottle to to our local producers. And uh, so today producers, they should import, they should import the bottle and uh, the currency exchange rate. Uh, so it's not the same as it was before the full scale war. So it also gives uh, some impact on the, on the price and uh, gives some problems to the producer, even to those producers which are situated in the not occupied territories. And uh, sure. another one, also big problem that... Uh, yeah. Okay, go, go, go ahead and finish. And then I have another question that follows uh, from, um, from our mm -hmm. students that are listening. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, uh, another one thing is that uh, there is no workers. So especially um, in in the um, in the places near the front line, of course, all people serve in the army, or people just gone from the country or move to another one more safe regions. So a lot of miners they just say that uh, we, are, we we don't have enough of people, and uh, that was uh, the question this year with the harvest as well. For example, I've spoke with uh, one winery. They are situated in Nikolaev region. They are not far from the front line, and they are bombing all, almost every day. And they said that uh, we are for a moment we have fifty percent of our workers. It's not the same as we had before. So, like literally, people uh, <clears throat> when working and harvesting, so um, they could be killed. So let's <laughs> let's uh, a lot of save the proper words. Ukrainian winemaking uh, today and in Ukraine all all together. We we are all there with you um, uh, and we're, we are ready to support. And with that, uh, we have actually quite a few questions from students. Uh, where can we find Ukrainian wines in US and what are the wine styles that we could be expecting here in US markets? Do you know the answer to that question? Uh um even me personally i was contacted a few times with the people who are interested to, to export uh, our wines to usa so i want to believe that even today you won't find a lot but you could find so we, i know at least two wine producers uh, who imports wines to usa for a moment so you can find shabo wines i'm not sure in which state exactly but you definitely have that wines in usa and another one producer from transcarpathia region the name of that producer is chateau chizai and you can find uh, that wines as well and uh, I hope that in the nearest future uh, we could bring a little bit more wines uh, to USA because a lot of importers uh, they was interesting. The problem with USA that the logistics today <laughs> is really is really really hard. If with Europe it's already almost sold, uh, uh, solved, and you can find uh, some Ukrainian wines in Europe, a lot in Estonia, a lot in Finland, and so on. With USA, it's a little bit more complicated, but uh, maybe in future we'll see more. I know, I know that uh, some wineries they already sent samples to, to 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 the potential importers. So let's see. Okay, well, perfect. Uh, we will be working on supporting uh, the Ukrainian winemaking and we're uh, looking forward to actually hear uh, for, about the um, the development and possibly we can, we, we can find more information about the wines that are available and will be available um, in the uh, US. We'll be sharing that information with our students. Um, with that, I would really like to to, uh, to thank Zhenya for her time. Our time is ending. Uh, hence, uh, I would like to 
uh, extend a great thank you. I know Zhenya has just moved out to Georgia, took a time literally a few days ago and took a time to spend the uh, hour with you um, and with us uh, telling us about the winemaking and her great, great passion as an ambassador of Ukrainian wines. This webinar will be available on a Napa Valley Wine Academy uh, membership. Um, uh, after uh, the recording, uh, but there's another way uh, if you want to support the uh, Ukrainian winemaking uh, together with us. We are donating Zhenya's uh, speaker fees to the organization, uh, the Association of Ukrainian Craft winemakers and you can do so as well in the link uh, that is in the presentation we will send out that link um, later on uh, as well Zhenya, thank you so much thank you for bringing up the information uh, about the ukraine to such needed and uh for for all of us uh, and uh, such a, a valuable information as the world does not know enough about the Ukrainian wines. I hope this will change. I hope, I hope you will be the change. I see one of the notes from one of the uh, students, Andrea Yakubovic, uh, and it is um, uh, it is re written that Duże dziękuję za informację. Slava Ukraine. <laughs> Heroim <laughs> Slava. Uh, Monica, thank you so much for giving me that opportunity. So um, I, I would say it, 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 it was like a kind of a dream to speak for Napa Valley Wine Academy. So it's something like incredible. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for those who joined us. Thank you if you will, if you will watch uh, this webinar a little bit later. And uh, it's a big, big pleasure to have an opportunity to speak about Ukrainian wines and to share in information. Thank you again. Uh, we'll be bringing more information about Ukrainian wines in the future. Thank you.